Hi everyone, we are very honored to have with us today Judge Kriyangsa Kitty Chasari, a judge of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. He will deliver a lecture today on the dispute settlement regime in the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Today's session will be moderated by Professor Patricia Galvotelis, Associate Professor of International Law at the Autonomous University of Lisbon and an adjunct senior researcher at the NUS Center for International Law. I will now pass the time to Patricia to deliver some opening remarks. Thank you so much, Alvin. I just wanted to uh, welcome Judge Kitty Chessery to say that it's uh, such a great pleasure to have you with us today uh, on behalf of Nilofer and myself and also on behalf on the, of the Center um, of, uh, for International Law of uh, NUS, uh, of which you've been uh, a long-standing friend and supporter uh, for a long time. So we are delighted to have you uh, to speak to us today on the module that we have on Law of the Sea, specifically about the dispute settlement regime in UNCLOS, which is really a world <laughs> of its own. And I'm sure our participants will benefit immensely from your experience. Um, as an academic, as also a former member of the ILC, but now more importantly, as a judge of the International Tribunal uh, on the Law of the Sea. And then to what will be certainly an active uh, session of discussion uh, with our dear participants. Um, judge, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Patricia, for this very warm welcome. And uh, the topic is a very complex one, so I try to simplify it as much as possible. And then if you have any questions, then I will be pleased to answer the questions. But um, as a judge, there is some, some limits to on how I, I should answer the questions. First of all, I cannot criticize my colleagues' opinions. So beyond that, I think I can answer any question re related to the topic. Okay, let's start with the PowerPoint presentation. There's some about 29 presentation that I hope you can see it clearly. So let's move to the next one. You see, um, the Lord of Sea disputes are mostly covered by the 1982 Lord of Sea Convention or UNCLOS, which now has 168 parties, including the EU. State of Palestine, Cook Islands, and New York. You know, these entities are not members of the UN, but somehow the third UN conference on the Lord of Sea allowed them to participate, to become part of the regime under UNCLOS so that uh, UNCLOS can cover all types of maritime issues all over the world. But interestingly, in the ASEAN region, Cambodia is the only one which is not party to UNCLOS. And the 1982 Lord Sea Conventions has part 15 as the main part for this pure settlement. And then the statute of the tribunal, the International Tribunal for the Lord Sea, or it lost for short, is uh, in Annex 6 of UNCLOS, which means the statue form part of UNCLOS as a whole. UNCLOS, it, it lost its base in Hamburg, but since June last year, it lost has concluded a model agreement with Singapore to allow us to sit in Singapore if the disputing parties choose to sit in Singapore instead of Hamburg. It happens sometimes in maritime dispute, for example, in the Chakos Island archipelago arbitration many years ago, uh, Mauritius refused to go to Europe. So the arbitral tribunal had to sit in Dubai and then in uh, Istanbul. So 
the choice of forum, the choice of venue is also left to the party if they wish. And uh, beyond Singapore, the tribunal is having some kind of contact with Bahrain and Argentina to do the same thing as Singapore is allow us to, to sit in Bahrain and Argentina if the party in the Middle East or Latin America wishes to do so. So unlike the International Court of Justice, which has 15 judges, the tribunal has 21 judges. In order to be more representative of all regions of the world. Another interesting point is that whereas the International Court of Justice ICJ judges are elected by simple majority, it lost judges need to be elected by at least two third majority of state parties, present and voting. And in order to be elected, the two third majority present and voting must represent majority of uh, state parties to the tribunal. And uh, as of now, Asia Pacific have five seats in it lost. It has been occupied by Japan, China, South Korea, India, and until my election in uh, 2017, a judge from Lebanon. I'm from Thailand, so Thailand has now replaced Lebanon as one of uh, the five occupiers of the seat of the tribunal. So let's go to the next PowerPoint. The way in which the convention allocates jurisdiction among the various forums is very complex. It lost itself has mandatory jurisdiction over prompt release of detained vessels and their crews under Article 292 of the Convention. I'll leave you to look at that. So from release here means if the coastal state arrests vessels and crews and after uh, imposing bonds and securities or uh, without demanding any bond security, they retain the vessels and crews. Then the flag state of the vessels may come to its loss to ask us to order prompt release of vessels and crew under Article 292. And the other compulsory jurisdiction for it lost is that Article 290, paragraph 5, which is quite complex itself, allowed parties to come to its loss to ask us to prescribe provisional measures pending the setting up of an arbitral tribunal to settle a dispute between them. So the process of setting up this kind of arbitral tribunal usually takes a long time. And one the parties may not consent to go to the tribunal. So in the interim period, 290 paragraph five allow the applicant to come to the tribunal in Hamburg to ask for uh, prescription of provisional measures. And the exclusive jurisdiction of the civil dispute chambers, which is a court within the tribunal itself, is on dispute settlements regarding activities in the seabed and subsoil of the ocean floor beyond limits of national jurisdiction, the so-called the area under part 11 of the convention, which is administered by the International Seabed Authority. So the next PowerPoint, please. The tribunal has jurisdiction, rational personnel and rational materia as follows. It lost statute, which is part six of Annex six of the convention, provide in Article 20 that it lost shall be open to first of all state parties to the 1982 Law Sea Convention. Secondly, entities 
other than state parties. So this one allows entities, maybe enterprises, corporations that are involved in contacting or exploring or exploiting the deep seabed under part 11 to be party to the dispute under jurisdiction of seabed dispute chamber. And then, or in any case, submitted pursuant to any other agreements conferring jurisdictions on it lost, which is accepted by all disputing parties. We come to that later on. And here, Article 21 expand the scope of jurisdiction of it loss in many ways to cover, first of all, all disputes. Secondly, applications submit to it in accordance with UNCLOS. So this period or dispute between two parties, application could be request for advisory opinion, submit to it in accordance with UNCLOS. That is submitted, for example, by uh, parties concerned requesting advisory opinion from the Civil Dispute Chamber. And thirdly, all matters specifically provided for in any other agreement which confer jurisdiction on it loss. Okay, let's go to the next one. Article 22 also expand its loss jurisdiction a bit further to cover disputes which a treaty convention already enforced and which concern subject matter, any subject matter covered under the 1982 Lawsuit Convention. If the parties to that kind of treaty in already enforced so agree, they may submit disputes or interpretation or application of such treaty or convention. So not necessarily uh, the 1982 Law Sea Convention, but application of such treaty conventions to it lost. And then Article uh, Rule 54, Paragraph 5 of the Rules of Tribunals also cover a situation of the so-called ad hoc consent given by the party outside any specific agreement or compromise that happened, for example, in the delimitation of maritime boundary between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, in which the parties have implicitly broadened the scope of their dispute to also cover dispute on international responsibility of oil and gas activities in their disputing area. And one provision which is not widely understood, but is crucial to understanding the law of the sea, as well as dispute settlement regime, is Article 293, Paragraph 1 of the Convention. Applicable law in contentious case. Judges are allowed to interpret the law to settle disputes they can use provisions under the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention or and or other rules of international law not incompatible with the convention. You see, here comes the issue in which, for example, there is a new subset of the Law of the Sea called Human Rights at Sea, deriving from the phenomenon of irregular migration at sea in the Mediterranean Sea. And one question that has come up many times is whether um, it lost, can somehow settle the sky dispute that concerns human rights. For example, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, International Labor Organizations Conventions. The answer is yes, because the provisions, insofar as provisions of these conventions represent or constitute other rules of international law that are not incompatible with the 1982 Law of Sea Convention, it lost can uh, interpret their 
provisions to settle dispute with, uh, before it lost. Let's move to the next PowerPoint. Here we have a long list of examples of other international agreements conferring jurisdiction on it lost. For example, the FAO Compliance Agreement on IUU Fishing, the UN Fish Stocks Agreement, and the 1996 Protocol on Marine Pollution by Dumping of Wastes and Other Matters, the UNESCO Underwater Cultural Heritage Convention, and of course the Draft Convention on uh, BBNJ, we come to that later on. And the standard formula here is that all these agreements say that the dispute settlement part, that is part 15 of the 1982 Law of Sea Convention, shall apply mutatis mutandis to any dispute between state parties to these agreements concerning interpretation, application of these agreements. You see, not necessarily the 1982 Law of Convention. And whether or not the disputing parties are also parties to the 1982 Law of Convention. So by the fact that they are party to one, any one of the agreements I just mentioned in this slide, they somehow incorporate this pure settlement regime under 1982 Law of Convention to settle this pure among them. So let's move to the next PowerPoint. Uh, like the International Court of Justice, the tribunal has two types of jurisdiction, contentious jurisdiction to settle dispute between disputing parties and advisory jurisdiction. <coughs> Excuse me. Here we have uh, Article 191 of the 1982 Lord Sea Convention that specifically authorized the seabed dispute chamber of the tribunal to render advisory jurisdiction, advisory opinions at the request of the international seabed authorities, assembly or council. But one uh, controversy is whether beyond the seabed dispute chamber, the tribunal can render advisory opinions on other matters they are not related to Part 11. In 2015, the full bench of it lost has interpreted Article 21 of the statute as the provision that allow it, that is the full bench of it lost, to give advisory opinions because Article 21 of the statute clearly say that it lost her jurisdiction to render decision or opinions on all matters specifically provided for in any other agreements which confer jurisdiction on it lost. And in the request submitted in 2013, the request was made by uh, seven parties to an international agreement that specifically confer jurisdiction on the full bench of it laws to render advisory opinions on the questions about the law sea sought by the parties to that this agreement. So this one has now become what you call uh, the established jurisprudence of it laws regarding uh, advisory opinion by the full bench of the tribunal. Let's move to the next one. Here, there are several choices for Lord C disputing parties to choose the tribunal, the ICJ, arbitral tribunals, and others. Um, the provisions that provide details of these choices appears in Article 280, 
287 and 288 of the 1982 convention. So it gives the disputing parties some kind of autonomy to choose before means to settle dispute. You see, uh, the conventions stipulate in Article 287 that the following are the choices specifically mentioned in the convention. It lost itself, ICJ, arbitration, except where it lost or CBA dispute chamber has exclusive or mandatory jurisdiction. The third conference um, was divided by several groups of state. One group of state preferred the ICJ to settle all Lord C disputes because in their views, the ICJ would ensure uniformity, consistency in international case law. However, another group of states preferred special Lord C tribunal which also allow access by non-state entities, such as corporations and enterprises engaged in deep seabed mining. And then another group of states would prefer arbitration because it permits flexibility. Of course, these states uh, do not like going to courts anyway, so they somehow um, offer an alternative in form of arbitration. And then yet another group of state would prefer a special procedure to settle a dispute, for example, fishery dispute, marine scientific research dispute, etc. So the 1982 law convention, law C convention tried to accommodate all these competing claims as follows. You will see the next uh, slide. Annex 7 arbitration, that is, where the disputing parties cannot agree on going to the tribunal or the ICJ, then they must go to arbitration. This happened, for example, in the case of the South China Sea dispute. So, Annex 7 arbitration, Annex 7, because uh, the regime that covers this kind of arbit arbitration appears in Annex 7 to the 1982 Law and Sea Convention. Constitute the so called default dispute settlement mechanism. And then Article 287, Paragraph 1D, set up special arbitral tribunals under Annex 8, composed of scientific and technical experts for dispute concerning fisheries, marine environment protection, and preservation of the marine environment, as well as marine scientific research, as well as navigation. Let me tell you that uh, 287 1D has never been used as of now. Let's move to the next one. Uh, here you find that the state parties to the 1982 Law and Sea Convention that have chosen it lost as their first choice. Our number do state that have chosen the ICJ or an X7 arbitration. Here yeah, we have a very long list of state choosing it lost in combination with the ICJ with uh, Annex 7, etc. Et et and the next PowerPoint will show you that some states, Portico and Timor Leste, accept all mechanisms without any preference. And it lost, is or was the first choice in specific disputes, for example, dispute uh, between Bangladesh and Myanmar, dispute between uh, Panama and uh, Italy, etc. Uh, the 1982 law of the sea conventions, 
the regime somehow accommodate dif different parties. So if two parties select more than one common forum, but in different priority, for example, state A may choose it lost as uh, the first choice, I suggest second choice, but the fact that they choose two forums allow another state that maybe choose the SHA as first choice, it lost as first choice to uh, the preference whether to use the SHA or it lost in specific dispute. Let's move to the next one. Uh, one frequently asked question is, why are there still so many law disputes decided by the SEJ? I uh, undertook an in depth study on the practice of Nicaragua, which is a regular customer before the SEJ. It has brought 15 cases in the SEJ to date, six cases against Costa Rica five cases against Honduras, three cases against Colombia. The only cases, is, the, the only other cases is against the USA in the so-called um, Nicaragua US case in uh, 1986 about military and parliamentary activities in and against Nicaragua. You see, I found out that these states except USA are parties to the Pact of Bogota, that is the 1982 agreements among member states of the Organization of American States, Article 31 of which automatically recognized as a jurisdiction as compulsory over disputes between them. So my point here is this, instead of having to overcome the issue of whether the court or tribunal has jurisdiction over dispute in question or not. Nicaragua is much easier to resort to the Pact of Bogota that somehow compels the other disputing body to go to the SCJ. And you see, you can see that Colombia is not yet party to 1982 Law C Convention. So Nicaragua somehow overcome this problem by saying, ah, Colombia until November 2012 was party to Pact of Bogota. So let's go to ICJ together. Next. And here we have a case recently decided by CJ last week, that is the maritime oh, limitation in the Indian Ocean between Somalia and Kenya. Kenya has to object to the CJ jurisdiction, say no, it somehow explicitly exclude the CJ jurisdiction from setting the dispute between it and Somalia. But the CJ said, no, we disagree with you. So I'm not going to that, but the point here is we have the issue of what you call jurisdictional problem, preliminary objection in which when some state find that existing agreements already recognize compulsory jurisdiction of the SEJ, it is much easier to use that kind of agreement than the 1982 Law C Convention. And another aspect of the cases in the SEJ that involves maritime disputes is that such disputes often also cover territorial insular claims, as in the case of the dispute between Guatemala and Belize, and the one between Gabon and Equatorial Guinea, in which the parties ask the SEJ to interpret not only uh, the law on maritime boundaries, but the truth is that somehow they say allocate land boundaries and sovereignty over three named islands to each of them. Next, please. 
and we have uh, possible advantages of an Annex 7 arbitral tribunal. First of all, the disputing body can choose arbitrators, so they don't have to uh, select any of the judges in SCJ or ITLOS. They can choose any arbitrators who, in their view, would favor their legal positions. And then there's uh, one argument, whether you like it or not, is that arbitration is more acceptable to domestic constituencies, public opinions, because if they lose, it means that they are not losing to a supranational body like it lost ICJ, but they lose to a body set up by themselves, uh, decided by arbitrators, selected by themselves. And arbitration has one benefit that is it has more confidentiality. It allows the parties to exclude third party intervention. Something which is not, which may not be uh, possible under the rules applicable to it loss or the SCJ. Next. However, it loss and SCJ do have many advantages over arbitration. We have detailed standing rules of procedures and benches of elected judges and permanent premises whose costs are defrayed, absorbed by their respective budgets, paid by state parties in the case of it loss and paid by UN member state in the case of ICJ. So each party normally bears on costs, that is lawyers fees, towing accommodation and other expenses. On the other hand, annex seven arbitral tribunals are very expensive. The parties have to pay the fees, I think about uh, four or 500 euros per hour for each arbitrators, as well as the services and premises provided by uh, registry that serves the arbitral tribunal in questions. And uh, it so happened that the disputing parties often cannot agree on appointing the remaining arbitrators. For example, state A may appoint one arbitrator, state B appoint another arbitrators, and then they just disagree on the appointment of the other three arbitrators, including the president of the arbitral tribunal. So they have to turn to the president of international tribunal for all the C to appoint the remaining three. And as usual, the president in consultation with the parties appoint sitting or former judges of it loss as the three remaining arbitrators, including as president of the arbitral tribunal in question. Next, please. Now let's look at it loss versus the ICJ. The SCJ has longer record of international dispute settlements, but its loss is more specialized in terms of law the sea. And the time span used by it loss is much shorter than the one used by the ICJ. For example, in the case between in the maritime boundary dispute between Myanmar and Bangladesh, from the start until finish of the case, it lost two, two and a half years only. And it lost 21 judges. I elected not by a political organs of the UN, unlike the ICJ. You see, ICJ judges are elected by the UN General Assembly, simultaneously by the UN Security Council. And Okay, let's go to the next slide. In practice, it lost had decided every law enforcement from release cases under Article 292. It's law cases also 
cover issues concerning detention, confiscation of ships, which is not covered by 292. For example, in the North Star case between Panama and Italy, the ongoing San Pedro Pio case between Switzerland and Nigeria. In other cases, for example, boundary delimitation, fisheries, marine environment protection, there is competition between the various forums. However, the parties usually come to it lost to ask for provisional measures regarding law to sea dispute. Next. The tribunal's jurisprudential contributions can be seen in many ways. In the case between Bangladesh and Myanmar, it was the first time that any international court or tribunal to render judgments on the limitation of show beyond 200 miles. And this judgment has been followed in the arbitration between Bangladesh and India and by the ICJ itself in Nicaragua and Colombia in November 12. And in a case decided by the ICJ last week between Somalia and Kenya. And it lost also the first court to determine the so-called gay area, which means that continental shelf by set A beyond 200 miles, which extend into the maritime zone, which is the exclusive economic zone of state B. You see, here we have situation in which in state B, the seabed belong to state A, and then the water quorums for fisheries issues, etc., belong to state B. And this is quite unique. Next. And this case is also very important. The case between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, because you know, all over the world, there are several overwhelming claims. And so the question is, what are the rights of the claimants in the orbiting area? You look carefully at the orders of it lost in 2015, as well as a judgment in 2017. You will know that it lost carefully spell out the rights duties of the claimants very clearly and what to do to somehow in the interim in order to reconcile the conflicting uh, rights of the parties. Next, please. And this one is very important in uh, the Lord of Sea. The so-called IEU fish illegal unreported and unregulated fishing, which has become a global phenomenon. It lost itself in several cases and decisions explain the rights and obligations of uh, various states, coastal state, black state, regional organizations, as well as third states, on how to deal with this one um, to combat IU fishing. And uh, the request for advisory opinions submitted by seven Western African states that uh, leads to the advisory opinion in 2015, clearly defines the rights of the respective state regarding IU fishing. So we go to the next one. And in relation to deep seabed mining, the advisory opinions by it lost in 2012 is crucial. You see, you consider the issue of common heritage of mankind, the main intended beneficiaries are the urban states. And deep seabed mining are not to be undertaken by developed state only, 
but also especially by the Whig states. And here, uh, in that particular situation, Tonga and Nauru found it difficult for them to determine what risk they would be facing if they sponsor applications for deep seabed mining by an entity from developed states. So the International Seabed Authority request advisory opinion from the Seabed Distribution Chamber to expand the scope, the limits of responsibility and liabilities of states sponsoring applications for deep seabed mining activities under part 11. So this somehow help expand to those interested how far they can take a risk. And this one is crucial for Singapore as well, because Singapore is also uh, one of the states that have uh, been involved in some kind of possibilities to explore and exploit deep sea bed mineral resources in the area. So the next uh, PowerPoint will tell you that the tribunal also has many cases that explain how the law of the sea protect and preserve the marine environment. What are the related principles? And in one of the advisory opinions, it lost CBS dispute chamber, even require uh, that the obligation to conduct an EIA, that is environmental impact assessment, is direct obligations under the 1982 Law Sea Convention. And it is also a general obligation under customary international law. And this one has been quoted by other courts and tribunals when they want to make sure that an EIA is necessary in a particular case. Let's go to the next PowerPoint. There are several limitations on the scope of jurisdiction for it lost as well as ICJ, as well as arbitral tribunal to proceed to such a dispute. Article 297 is very complex. To make it easy to understand, I would say that basic freedoms and rights and other international lawful uses of the sea are subject to compulsory dispute settlement mechanism. However, when it comes to the issue of discretion exercised by coastal state, for example, in granting total allowable caches, in consenting to or denying consent to uh, marine scientific research, here the issue is more complicated. They are completely excluded from adjudication, but they may be subject to conciliation if the state concern seriously or blatantly abused their discretion under, given to them under the 1982 Lord of Sea Convention. Next, please. Here we have 298. So my colleague said, they have spent decades trying to understand the scope limits of the so-called optional exceptions. You see, 298 allows state parties not to accept corporate jurisdiction of uh, the various forums under the convention. In the case of sea boundary limitation, or those involving historic base or titles, in which case they have to go to conciliation instead. This happens, for example, in the case conciliation between Timor Leste and Australia. And some other um, issues that are excluded, military activities, including military activities by government vessels and aircraft 
in non-commercial services and law enforcement activities. But the law enforcement activities in questions must concern exercise of sovereign rights jurisdiction. Here, international courts and tribunals interpret the limitations really narrowly. The first thing we do is we characterize the dispute in question in the light of the facts of each case. You see that in this, uh, the case between Netherlands and Russia, in the Arctic sunrise dispute, Russia argued that its action against Greenpeace, Brussels, protesting against its drilling in the Arctic was purely law enforcement activities. But the tribunal said no. It might be law enforcement activities, but from the fact of that case, we decided that the activities did not involve exercise of rights jurisdiction. And more recently, in the dispute between Ukraine and Russia regarding passage in the Crimean Sea and the arrest by Russia of Ukrainian uh, warships and naval officers, Russia said it was part of military activities, but we found that no, it was not. It was purely law enforcement activities, which did not involve exercise of sovereign rights by Russia. And okay, let's go to the next. Mixed dispute. You see, some disputes involve not only maritime boundaries, but also territorial sovereignty. Who own which islands? Who own which land territory? That is the starting point of the sea boundaries. Article 298 does not clarify whether concurrent land sovereignty issues are also excluded. But the general understanding among judges is that both ITLOS and the SEJ can decide a so-called mixed disputes provided that the territorial sovereignty issue is not the main issue, but is only ancillary to the dispute in questions. And it lost a proceed this way in the in this judgment in January this year in dispute between Mauritius and the Maldives concerning limitations of maritime boundary between Mauritius and Maldives in the Indian Ocean, in which it lost say that the UK is not an indisputable third party without whose presence before it lost, it lost cannot decide the case. So let's move to the next one. There are several unutilized and used provisions under it lost in which it lost can exercise jurisdiction, but so far we have not proceeded. Article 23 is a very clear example. Coastal states, destruction of foreign fishing vessels arrested for alleged illegal fishing in EESAT is something which is subject to commercial jurisdiction of it loss. But as, we, as I understand it, it has not come before it lost so far because fishermen, they don't have bargaining power to ask the flag state or the state of their nationality to pursue uh, a case to protect their interests. Next one. We also have many disputes that are lying in wait. Mining court for deep seabed mining in the area, which is being finalized by the International Seabed Authority. We also allow seabed dispute chamber to settle dispute under the mining court. 
And then this view concerning Article 82, the payments contributions by coastal state arising from exploration of non-living resources of condition between beyond two hundred miles. This is new. And then this view concerning uh, submarine cables and island submarine cables. This is also subject to uh, it lost jurisdiction, but which has not yet arisen. Next one. There are several new fields, for example, BBNJ, I think you all know of, and then zero rise. Here, it lost can give a rational opinion pursuant to Article 21 of the statute. Next one, the last one, is human rights at sea. I already mentioned that this is a new subset issue of the law of the sea in which it lost, can also have a role to pay. And then the next one, thank you. It, it, I think it's question and answer, I think. Thank you so much, Judge Kitty Chessery. And I think we have to thank the internet connection also for having um, cooperated. Uh, and, and thanks so much for this uh, excellent overview of what I think it's the, um, the most comprehensive dispute settlement um, regime in any international convention, but also, of course, the most complex. And you explain very well the different complexities also in the relation with the International Court of Justice, which I think it's a, it's a, it's a, a subject of its own. And, and also you have advanced, um, you know, some of the work that the ITLAS has accomplished so far in terms of its case law, um, considering that it's still um, a recent court, and, and I remember well uh, when uh, the convention came into force, um, the fears that uh, it laws would not have uh, cases, I think they have not materialized uh, clearly. So let's open the floor for questions. I think we can take two or three questions from our participants. Um, let's see who wants to. Uh, there's nothing in the chat so far, but please feel free to Turn on your mic, raise your hand, and ask uh, questions to Judge Kitty Chessery, uh, who um, has uh, certainly, you know, a restriction given the fact that he's sitting on the bench, but certainly he'll find a way to be able to answer your questions. So, anyone? Okay, so we have Samir. Samir, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Professor, for your amazing lecture. But I had a question concerning the case between Russia and Ukraine in the Kelch Strait. Because if I'm not mistaken, it happened in November of 2018. And it was a very interesting case because there are rules in the call regs and many rules and the agreements between Russia and Ukraine concerning the cooperation in the Kelch Strait, which by the way, is not basically term terminated after the well, annexation of Crimea. Well, in the call regs, they are written, it, it was a rule 29 because Kerch Strait is qualified as a dangerous strait. And when the ships pass through in that kind of areas, they should they are required to use the services of, of pilot ships at the same time. And in the case of Ukraine, there have been quite a few violations of the call regs, which were not raised at the court. And at, this, and at the same time, starting from the February of 2018, Ukrainian ships throughoutly asked permission of Russian side to enter, to enter the Azov Sea. But this time, it's just like a they decided to ram into the Azov Sea without the, let's say, like the permission of Russia. Well, I don't say that the Crimea is Russian, but at the same time, they de facto control the territory and they exercise their sovereignty right now. Uh, you see, you 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 ask very complex questions, and um, I think uh, Ukraine not only brought a case against Russia in the. It lost an arbitral tribunal, but also European Court of Human Rights. So there are so many cases between Russia and Ukraine. But in the context of the law, the sea, 
um, there are two aspects. That is the one, the arrest by Russia of uh, Ukrainian warships and crew, that is naval officers. And it lost determined issue of provisional measures. And then there is also arbitral tribunal on that dispute, which is ongoing. And then before that, the issue of Crimea, in which there is another arbitral tribunal composed of different judges, which are dealing with that, which is also ongoing. So I cannot say that, uh, answer your question in this way, because the case is still ongoing, and uh, I, I cannot um, speak on behalf of myself or the judges, which way the arbitral tribunal will decide um, the issue, but it's very complex and it's still what you call subjudice ongoing. And we have a um, short question here. Let me look. Yes, if you want, I can read it out loud. Maybe it's yes, okay, uh, easy okay, for okay. everybody. So from okay. Karubo, a question, an interesting question from Karubo. Uh, from your experience as a judge, uh, do these multiple dispute settlement systems um, from the ICJ, it laws, and the arbitral tribunals under the law of the sea create some uh, certain form of inconsistency in jurisprudence relating to this field of law, or this is not a, this is not a problem that has been experienced yet? Uh, surprisingly, there is no call uh, consistency in international law in which it lost sight, it's the ICJ, the ICJ side it lost, and sometimes we cite the judgment of the award by arbitral tribunals to support our case. So the issue is not consistency, the issue is not competition, but the issue is how convincing the arguments, the reasoning of the forum are. So I can tell you that it is the lawyers who raised the points. So they argue that, okay, according to SCJ, paragraph 70, 72 of the Sala, the SCJ says so, and if lost, should find this paragraph convincing. And then we consider whether it is convincing or not. If we're not convinced, we just ignore it. But we found it convincing, we just accept it. So it, there is no such thing as binding decision but how convincing the reasoning, the arguments are. And then the consistency, as I, I inform you, the SDJ side it lost in, in terms of the extension of limitation area beyond 200 miles. And we also cite uh, several case law SDJ, especially in terms of procedure, how to settle the dispute, the issue of extortion recall remedies nationality of claim, for example. So there is no inconsistency. Next question. Yes, so we have a couple more uh, on the chat and also uh, from the floor, if I can say so. So I'll take one from the chat and then one from the floor, we'll alternate. So from the chat uh, from James, um, could you please elaborate on the basis under which it laws deals with human rights at sea? I understand that the dispute uh, resolution provision of UNCLOS relates to the interpretation and application of UNCLOS. So how does human rights fit into that? Uh, as I informed you earlier, okay. In several cases, it lost. Speaks really said that human rights apply not only on land, but also at sea. And then you look at uh, applicable law that is Article 293, Paragraph 1. A court of tribunals with jurisdiction under 1982 Law Convention shall apply the Convention and other rules of international law not incompatible with the convention. You see, and in fact, there is one case concerning human rights at sea, the case between Panama and Italy, North Star case, throughout the written proceedings, as well as oral arguments 
Panama raised issue of human rights, due process of law, the rights under the 1966 International Covenant on Civil Political Rights, which are deprived allegedly by Italy. But you see, in its final submission, Panama surprisingly did not include human rights. Maybe, it, maybe it, it found out that when it raised the issue of human rights, it was too late because if you look carefully at uh, the rules of the tribunal, the other parties must be informed of the cases, the points in various stages of the proceedings and Panama raised human rights issue quite late without Italy being duly informed. That's why it dropped human rights issue at the last minute in the final submission. But here we have possibility in which human rights can be arbitrated before the tribunal. Next, please. Yes, we'll take now the question from Madonia, uh, who is going to ask a live question. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Judge, for uh, this uh, presentation. Very, very uh, educating presentation. Uh, two questions, maybe comments. One is uh, uh, the trend by uh, most states to reject uh, jurisdiction when they have lost the case. And I'm talking about the Kenyan issue and Somalia. You know, where Kenya has come out, you know, of course, that is, uh, that does not really go well. But what would you think would be uh, the way forward? Is this a trend that worries you? And uh, secondly, is on the issue of uh, dispute settlement versus advisor opinion. Uh, do you see more states coming for advisor opinion in ITROS? And how do the advisor opinion in ITROS, for example, compared to the advisor opinion in ICJ? Are they more of a technical nature or, you know, you know, like more general? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. On the first question, it is very sensitive. I can tell you one thing. It's a usual practice for every state that comes before the tribunal to say they win. Even if you say they lose, <laughs> they'll say, we win. You will go, go back home, you know, normally you say, we have won the case. Whether you believe it or not is another issue. But regarding the issue of Kenya, Somalia, you see, uh, ideally, I would prefer not to uh, get involved in this, this dispute whether Kenya is a losing side or Kenya does not accept uh, the judgment of um, the SCJ. But as I told you earlier, Kenya itself has refused to accept the SCJ jurisdiction from the start, saying that we already exclude SCJ jurisdiction when we become party to the Chinese Sioux Law Sea Convention. But you, you know that. Um, the NCJ judgments are binding on the party to dispute whether or not you are losing or the winning side. And this appear in, I think, relevant uh, uh, documents, the UN Charter as well as um, the SJ statute that is, even though you are not there, then when we render judgment, it buys from you. And um, in principle and in letters, SJ judgment can be enforced by the UNSC. But whether yes, UNSC will enforce or not is another issue. Whether I'm worried about uh, the trend in which the losing party do not accept the uh, decision or judgment of international courts. I will say that the judgments or opinions keep the winning parties the so-called moral high ground to pursue with the other party diplomatically, bilaterally, in the international field, as well as in other forums. I remember one case in which I was directly involved is the case between Ukraine and Russia. By the vote of 20 to 1, it lost 
rule in favor of Ukraine, ordering Russia to release the three uh, Navy vessel, naval vessels, as well as the naval officers. Russia did not appear in the case. But a few months later, there was some kind of agreement between the parties to release the vessels without referring to the order by it lost, what you call exchange of prisoner, you see? And then President Putin and the president of Ukraine met for the first time in Paris after release of the ship. You see, this is somehow in which, although you don't accept it, but it has snowballing effect, giving the winning party more high ground to use against the other party. I think the EU itself has cited it lost judgment many times to pressure Russia in the case of arm um, in the incident. And now at my opinion, that is interesting. Unlike the ICJ, Article 21 of Israel statute allow states to ask it lost for advisory opinion, provided they have concluded an international agreement conferring jurisdiction on it loss to render advisory opinion. You see, this is different from the SEJ. The SEJ can only give advisory opinions at the request of UN General Assembly, UN Security Council, or other UN bodies within the competence of their jurisdiction. You see, here we have a situation in which one uh, South Pacific Island state would like to mobilize the General Assembly to request the SEJ's advisory opinion on climate change. You see, to be realistic, that will never happen because the P5, etc., will certainly will not agree. But in terms of it lost, ASEAN, Pacific Islands forums, the CURRICOM can come to it lost, provided that they have some kind of MOU agreement allowing them to ask it lost to render advisory opinion on, say, the effect on civil rights, on maritime entitlements, on statehood, on the rights of persons have been dislocated because of civil rights. And you see, this is interesting in the sense that I, I told my colleagues many times ago that ASEAN interests regarding sea level rise may be different from those of Pacific Island State from the CARICOM. And the EU itself may be interested in sea level rise because if, say, it lost, somehow recognize the so called fixed boundary lines declared by a uh, small island state. What about Netherlands? What about Williams? They are not island states. To what extent will this kind of advisory opinion affect their rise? Uh, to be honest with you, not so long ago, one of law firms that appeared before it lost confide in to me during one of the reception that one of their clients was interested in asking a rest of it and for it was regarding sea level rise. But the only issue is how you frame the question. Because if you don't carefully frame the question and we give the answer, it may somehow backfire to the extent that our answer may worsen the situation for the clients. You see, this is some kind of practical considerations to be considered. I hope that I answer your question already. Yeah, Thank you, you so did. much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Judge Kitty Judge. I'm now in the impossible situation of uh, seeing that there are two hands up plus two more questions in the chat. So I think uh, because we're already over time and we are abusing the um, generous time of Judge Kitty Chester, I think we're going to end the session now, as I, as I had predicted and warned Judge Kitty Chaisere, um, this was going to be a, 
you know, an interesting session with a lot of interest from the participants. But uh, if judge, if you agree, what we can do is that we can, uh, uh, with the help of Alvin, um, uh, give the questions to you and then and by in writing, and then we can see if uh, uh, there is some feedback on your side. But with this, I would uh, really um, take the opportunity of thanking you for you know, your, your excellent presentation, for the interest that you've motivated in our participants, for all the questions that were asked and some of them not answered. I also wanted to thank uh, Prof Beckman for having been with us. And uh, we would uh, continue tomorrow uh, for the rest of uh, uh, the lecture with Prof uh, Beckman and, and, and uh, Dr. Chair Davenport. And uh, uh, Judge Kitty Chaser, we're so happy that the internet uh, helped us today and more happy than uh, uh, that, uh, that you've uh, been uh, joining the Academy and uh, gave us an excellent uh, lecture and um, caught certainly the interest uh, of all participants. On behalf of uh, Nilofer and myself, a warm thanks to you and also on behalf of uh, all the Academy and the participants. And I think the virtual uh, clap uh, <laughs> is, uh, is, is in order. Thank nice you so much, you. Judge. And uh, the rest of the participants see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.